everyone. I'd also like to take a quick poll. How many people consider themselves makers? Okay, who's not raising their hand? Now raise your hand. You are liars. So how many people, tell me, I'm gonna actually pick somebody out. I'd like to actually embarrass somebody. Who has made something recently that they're very proud of? Raise your hand and then I'll pick on you. Oh, the young lady in front of the television. Oh yeah. A harness for your dog, sweet, awesome. And why did you make it? Awesome, and where did you make it? At home. At home, fantastic. So we've just learned about a maker, we've just learned about what they've made, and we've just learned about their maker space. So, which I think is, is quite fascinating. I really think we're all makers. We have these things called hands with opposable thumbs. So, to make is human, I believe. I, I also consider myself a maker, although I haven't really been making things a lot lately. I've been doing more of making spaces. And the reason why is because I grew up a maker as a young kid. I was always tinkering with things, taking apart the fan, fixing the fan, destroying things. I remember I fixed my neighbor's lawnmower and spilled gas all over the garage. They had to actually evacuate their house in the middle of the night. They're still friends. They were very nice about it. I then did fix it later. But as I got older, I became very frustrated because I, I felt like I started to lack the spaces and connections to continue making. It sort of seemed like, okay, it was now time to go to college, it's time to get serious. I did explore engineering programs. I actually was looking into engineering and I ended up being a physics major and I didn't like the math so I ended up becoming an economics major. And that wasn't awesome. I actually fell asleep a lot. But so in college I, I was doing the economics and then I started to build lofts and do these things which would still excite me to a certain extent. Played a lot around with computers, and then I was like, okay, well, you know, computers, that's making decent money, so I'll be a computer guy. And I did. I graduated college, became a computer guy, and it was, it was okay. I didn't feel like it was tapping into my creativity a lot, but I was actually very fortunate. This is around the dot-com era when things were really at their peak, and I was fortunate to work with a company that actually is partnered with the MIT Media Lab. So I, they brought me to the Media Lab and that just blew my mind. All of a sudden I saw a place where I'm like, wow, people actually do this? And they actually took me to uh, a couple of architecture schools in the area in Boston, the Graduate School of Design at Harvard, and the Graduate School, or in the School of Design at MIT, and all of a sudden my mind was blown. I was like, wow, people actually do this for a living? Because the only person that I knew that designed things or that made buildings was Mike Brady. So if anyone knows what Mike Brady is, <laughs> I thought he was the only one. He must have done everything. So it's a very nice building that Mike Brady did. But that passion, you know, that passion and that discovery made me start to develop a passion for my, re, really reignited my passion for making things. Definitely started a passion for how do we make these spaces and how do we develop these connections. And then it started, and, and somehow actually I started to think about how do I help other people do this? Because I started to get actually different positions and different jobs. I actually did go to Cranbrook Academy of Art for Architecture, which is a really uh, another amazing makerspace of sorts, very multidisciplinary. And while there, I learned about Detroit. And I actually read a book called Tools of Conviviality by Ivan Illich. I don't know if anyone's ever read that book. I highly recommend it. And it really started to make me think about, well, what are the tools and the places and the things that really start to make better lives for more people as much as possible? What are these things that increase our, our social interaction and build community and also tap into our awesome desire to develop creative things? So with these passions and with this desire, I eventually made my way back to Detroit and I decided to develop this thing that I at the time was calling a makerspace because it didn't seem to fit anywhere else. And it was really a place that I wanted to see if, if I could expose people to an, at an earlier age or wherever they were at to this awesome creative act of making and, and see what it would do and to see if we could do it the, at the lowest cost possible. So I'd like to share with you a video which, which explains that space and maybe gives you a, a better glimpse into what we're doing there. At the Mount Alley Makerspace, we have four areas of concentration and they include transportation, electronics, digital media, and wearables. 
It is the hottest thing in Church of the Messiah right now. It is where a lot of the young people, as well as a lot of the adults, come in and um, they get to express themselves. Besides building things, I like to fix things. Like, I fix the stereo and their speakers. I use the drill, a hammer, and um, a heat gun. I think a screwdriver. Yeah, a screwdriver, too. The space is it's productive and it's time consuming. You know what I'm saying? So, while you're here, you can actually get something done, but at the same time, you're not out with the temptations of doing anything else, you know what I'm saying? You're not, you you don't actually think about you don't have any money in your pocket if you just made like, you know what I'm saying, four or five something. At the Makerspace, we facilitate learning experiences for people. So we, we want to connect people to each other, someone who may have knowledge in an area that someone does not. And likewise, we want to provide learning experiences as, I guess, facilitators or conductors of the makerspace. Didn't know nothing about the hard drive, the C drive, the disc. I mean, what makes it function with the fan, the motherboard. You know, I really got tired of spending my money out and don't know what was wrong with my computer. And what makes it so good, though, hands on. That would make it so different. You know, I'm touching, I'm fixing, I'm unscrewing, seeing what made it tick, how I'm putting something back together. When I came here, I mean, like I said, it really gave me something positive to stand on. Yeah. I had class, but when I don't have class, I'm gonna get some money. I don't have to worry about money because the church is really helping me do my dream, like what I've been really wanting yeah, to do, you know? Yeah, it's, it's helping me build something. I wouldn't mind being part of something that's, that's stable enough for the whole community to get a part of. The Makerspace, what I really love is that it provides a safe and a healthy place for my children. It's benefited my life in the way of, I wasn't getting enough exercise until I earned my bike. Well, it's improved my life because as you can see, me and my son get to work together because he's helping me earn a bike. What we're trying to do now is to continue to develop this model of a makerspace, but also to develop a network of makerspaces. We don't want to be the only one. We want other people to be developing makerspaces in parallel with us so that we can then get together and learn from each other and develop even better and even faster. All right. You can fade that out. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks. <clears throat> As you can imagine, I'm particularly proud of all of the work that is being done there. This space is really awesome. It's, I think it's really important because after a while we've developed our mission. And our mission is, it is a, is a place for learning and tinkering and making things together as a way to strengthen ourselves and our communities so that we can live healthier, happier, and more meaningful lives. So that we can create those lives for ourselves. And this involves a lot of skills. And I know there's a lot of talk about STEM and STEAM, which is science, technology, engineering, and math, and science, technology, engineering, math, and arts. And I think those things are important. But in order to make more creative people, you know, which actually creative lawyers are good and creative accountants are good and creative doctors, all these things are very important. So in order to make more creative people, I think we need to think about more core skills that aren't just 21st century skills, they're any century skills. And to me, that's developing skills like creativity, problem solving, courage and persistence so you won't stop and you'll keep trying things even when you fail multiple times, collaboration, self-reliance, community reliance and adaptability. These things, this breadth of skills, you'll be able to do almost anything with those. And another very important skill that we develop there is the ability to exchange things, or entrepreneurship. And I'll tell you a little bit about that with a story about Raven. So Raven was the young lady with the, with the cloth on her head, which actually was the beginning of her making her own sari. So a sari, by the way, is an Indian dress. I did not know that. She came up to me and said, I'd like to make a sari. I'm like, sweet, sorry. You know, and she's like, it's an Indian dress, because she knew I was looking it up. And so I was like, yeah, sure, go right ahead. And Raven's quite a unique kid. She's quite amazing. She's actually taught over 200 people how to solder. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, and she actually 
helps, she draws in other young people which also help people learn how to solder. And I've brought them actually to the farmer's market in Detroit and we've worked on things like how to actually sell that as a service to people and how much the little solder badges that we make cost and how to market yourself and then how to count up everything afterwards and how to divvy that up fairly. So this is the way that we develop both making skills and skills for exchange because I think it's important that we teach those as early as possible. That's the real world that we're going to be in when we're done with school. So let's make sure the kids know how to do that so they can even do that while they're in school. I think another great story is about Dwight. So that was the young man who was talking about music. Uh, Dwight, actually, I don't see him so much at the makerspace anymore, but that's because he found another studio outside the makerspace where he's doing a lot of work with a producer who's making his music while he writes it. He came down, said he was interested in music, and so I said, hey, well, here's GarageBand. I didn't even know how to use GarageBand. He sat in front of it, figured it out, started making music with his friend Bobby, and actually, then he went out about two months later, went to the Hard Rock Cafe and won amateur night, won $5,000. Yeah. So those are only a couple stories, and if I had a lot of time, I'd tell you a bunch more. But these stories are incredibly inspiring and make me so excited when I'm there that it makes me really wish that I could do more. Well, these stories have inspired a vision that is not a new vision. It's fortunately a vision a lot of people have, is that we need to develop and strengthen a network of these makerspaces. And they could be small ones, like this makerspace, which is in the basement of a church, larger ones, which may exist in a library or may be connected to the MIT Media Lab or to my former hackerspace, NYC Resistor, or my current hackerspace, Omnicorp Detroit. But developing those connections and those relationships will be very important so people can find their passion, really get deep into it, find their peers, find these connections and spaces that were so important to me and hopefully earlier rather than later. Because if we find something that we love to do, we'll do that better than anything else. And that, to me, will make a better world. So this vision and this network that we're building, we've already started. There's, there's hacker spaces. There's actually almost 1,000 all over the world. I think, you know, Fab Labs, there's probably, boy, over 100 of those. And there are youth maker spaces developing in schools, libraries, and elsewhere. And I think that's very exciting. What's also exciting to me is developing these maker spaces in schools. But my passion is, how can we make maker spaces in schools absolutely indistinguishable? How can you be so excited about going into school that you're actually going in there and you can't wait to get there because you're gonna work on something that might be a real problem to solve in your community, or you're gonna create something amazing. And you're gonna learn about math, and you're gonna learn about systems of exchange, you're gonna learn about science and biology and all these other very important things, but you're gonna do it doing something that you love. And so these spaces, this network will be awesome because we're gonna learn so much from each other as we do it. And I'd like to share with you three things that I've learned while being in Detroit. First thing I've learned that's most important is that race and privilege are a pretty serious concern in Detroit and in many cities. One thing I did learn is you can't just come in there and pretend you're gonna do something and save the city or whatever. Fortunately, I knew that before I came in, so I said, I'd like to bring this. Where does it fit? And we found out where it fit in a church. But a lot of times I think people are going into cities in Detroit and they wanna save things, they wanna do whatever. Please understand, there's been a lot of people there who have been trying to save things for a while, and they're tired. So if you want to, I think doing the right thing is to be supportive. Find out how you can create spaces and how you can connect people in a way that amplifies all of these existing amazing resources. The second thing that I've learned is that everybody, I believe, is born with some sort of a capability or a gift. And if we start fertilizing the ground for that gift to grow and blossom, it will be a better world we will be better people. The third thing I've realized, and this is to touch upon what Shaka was talking about, and it's amazing how I'm feeling like finishing in the same way, is that love is critically important. These maker spaces, at least the ways that I'm very passionate about developing them, they're not as much about making things as they are about connecting people with each other. It's as much about empathy and love as it is about making things. In fact, making things is really a way to get to compassion, to empathy, to understanding, to share with one another. And if we start to learn that, if we start to regain that feeling of love for ourselves, love for our communities, and begin to strengthen community, I really think that every city that's having trouble, in our own country, and many countries the world over, will be better and stronger. Thank you very much. <laughs>